Welcome back for the last session for this workshop for tonight, inshallah. A uh, few topics to be covered. I will try to go through them as much as possible. We don't have a lot of time, so let's see how much can we achieve. And when we talk about time, this is something that we don't control. When we say time management, the topic itself is inaccurate actually. Because time management indicates that you can manage time and this is not true. What you can manage is your actions. Your interaction with time, that's what you can manage. Time, you cannot tell time to stop. Allah can, but we cannot. And Allah Azza wa did stop the time for his messengers, for Yusha ibn Nun, for the Prophet وسلم, but not for us. So that's another issue. What you can do during time. And I cannot stress enough the fact that doing more doesn't mean achieving more. Being focused and trying to achieve, that's what matters. Even if you do less. People feel that they are behind, so they try to do more, but actually they end up doing what? Less. Uh, I will share with you something practical, and this requires a pen and paper. Everyone, I want you to write a sentence. Before you do that, uh, have you been in a situation sometimes when you try to do more than one thing at a time? Yes or no? What do we call that? Multitasking. multitasking. What do you think of multitasking? In Mecca, there was no jihad, only in Medina. In Mecca, there were 360 idols surrounding the Kaaba. It was not time. When you are focused and doing only one thing at a time and you make sure you finish it, you achieve. You do things right. But you jump from one place to another. You want to do everything. You end up doing nothing. So she's still writing the sentence. It's just an example. This is what we think we are doing. Multitasking, let's just know. Do one thing at a time. You know what this will help you doing or achieving? Priorities. Prioritizing. Doing what should be done first. Before anything else. So, if you end up doing what is best, at least you did what is best. Even if you didn't do anything else. So do not jump from one thing to another. No. Do one thing at a time. Again, above all, this is what? This is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One thing at a time. Don't text and drive. That's an example. Okay, our time is limited. This is one of the assets we have that we will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. So the smart is the one who thinks about what will happen next. How can I generate hasanat even long time after my death? So think about something that will generate hasanat for you even after your death. Plant a seed. You see, the Prophet وسلم, said, If the final hour were to be established and one has a small plant, a sapling, the final hour is already established. Will this small plant grow? Will it have time to live and bear fruits? Yes or no? No! So you could think of many reasons not to plant it. Yet, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Plant it. Why? It's the right thing to do. 
hope. Always do what is right, regardless of what people say. We all know the consequences of procrastination. There is a long story, one of the longest narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari, about Ka'b radiallahu anhu. His son, Abdullah bin Ka'b, he narrates the hadith from his father, Ka'b ibn Zuhair radiallahu anhu, that his father didn't join the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle of Tabuk, although he was ready. Why? He just procrastinated until it was too late. You know this is like what? It's like paying with interest. You don't do what you're supposed to do today, tomorrow you will do it with interest. What's the ruling on interest in Islam? Riba. It's haram. So if you approach time like that, you will use your time efficiently. You received an email. Uh, I will read it later. Never ever do that. Now you don't have time, chances are tomorrow what will happen, you will not have time. Either read it or delete it. Don't pile up tasks. The more time you will have, the busier you will get. And this works both ways, which means if you don't have enough time to read others' emails, don't write also long emails. Train yourself to be to the point. This is what I do personally. I don't like giving long talks, khutbas or speeches. Maximum, like khutbas, I don't give more than 15, 20 minutes maximum. Why? Go to the point, straight to the point. Again, largest companies and corporations around the world, they pay money to deliver their message in 30 seconds only. So you talk and talk and talk and then what? Where are the actions? That's what matters. At the time of the Prophet Wasallam, they talked less but they worked more. Now, mashallah, we can talk a lot. We talk a lot but we achieve less. So, this is what I wanted to share with you about this topic. There are many other things to share but hopefully this would make a point. Last thing about self-development. And one important thing is the ibadah. There is no better way to improve yourself than ibadah. Ibadah is the shield. What shield? Shield against the tribulations and the difficulties that you face in your dunya. You seek knowledge, you attend classes, you volunteer, yes, but don't deceive yourself. This cannot be, can never be at the expense of ibadah. Not just the fard, but the nafil. If you are really aspiring to achieve high, then you don't leave the obligations. That's out of question. But also you don't leave the sunnah. Example, our very gathering, this one. It's Adhan time, that's it. What was the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? We used to be in dialogue, in communication with the Prophet ﷺ. Once he hears the Adhan, as if he doesn't know us. It's time for Allah. Once it is time for Allah, that's it. The Shaitan comes to you from that door. Uh, it is for the sake of Allah. No. Allah tells you at that time, He wants you to be here. Ibadah, reading Quran, dhikr, prayer, fasting. Do enough ibadat that will be a shield for you. When everyone is asleep, you are awake, praying tahajjud, qiyamul layl. So, this is important and it goes hand in hand with volunteering. You want to be a better volunteer, you have to be a better worshipper to Allah Azza wa Jal. It cannot be in any other way. Don't deceive yourself. So, increase your ibadah. And one unfortunate thing that I notice from some brothers and sisters who are involved in da'wah, that the shaitan comes to them, telling them they are better than others. I am niqabi. Who are you? You are only hijabi. Since when appearance is the main judgment? Since when? 
So don't deceive yourself. Don't let the shaitan. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, perhaps a'ibadah caused the one who did it to enter hellfire. Ibadah. You pray during the night when everybody is asleep, but you started showing off. Who's better than me? Everyone is, is asleep. I am awake. And perhaps a ma'siya, a sin, caused it's the one who committed it to enter Jannah. When he felt the heat of it and he repented to Allah Azza wa Jal. So do not deceive yourself. Put things in the right perspective. You did volunteer, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, but that's it. Don't think that you are better than others. Don't start showing off. Who are they? I, I am better than them. That's a killer for people who are involved in da'wah. And I have seen that, subhanAllah. So, anytime you have a chance to improve yourself, go ahead. Because you don't know. Maybe this is something that will help you for the sake of Allah. Don't miss on anything unless you have something better when you are focused. I know this is good, but I'm sorry. It's good for you, not for me. I have something else. Yes, that's fine. Be focused. In Hudaybiyah, the event of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet wasallam had to negotiate with the Kuffar. Although he is the messenger of Allah, yet he had to negotiate with the Kuffar. Why? Because that's how life is. You don't get things your way always. Especially after marriage, you will realize that. So, you have to negotiate. People think that you just tell them what you have, take it or leave it. Life doesn't work that way. Again, you learn that from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He compromised on certain things, but every single thing that he compromised on, it turned out to be in favor for the Muslims. Although initially Muslims, some of them were not happy with the agreement. Umar radiallahu an, one of them. So, here you are told, whether you are a buyer or a seller, that you have a business deal between 36 and 42. Now, before you see the other party's paper, you didn't know. So, as a buyer, you had up to 42. So if you say, I bought for 40, so I saved two, yes. But just because you are given all the money, does it mean you have to spend all the money? Remember, when you are negotiating, oh, I am on a deadline. Yes, maybe the other party also on a tighter deadline. That's important to remember. Always know your area, your grounds for negotiation. So, the fair price between 36 and 42 is 39. That's fair. That's win-win. If you bought for more than that, the seller was better. If you bought for less than that, the buyer was better. So whoever bought for 36, that's amazing. 35! <laughs> MashaAllah. So you end up paying from your pocket. MashaAllah. So I guess you are ready to volunteer since you are willing to pay from your pocket. MashaAllah. So this is just a reminder. These are skills that you need in your day-to-day -day life, in your self-development. So that's what I wanted to leave you with. Uh, there are a few other things, but I think what was done is enough, inshallah. I hope you heard something beneficial. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that we leave tonight with better understanding of religion, being better Muslims, inshallah. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept from all of us. Aqulu qawli hadha wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, we have some time left, about 15 minutes, if you still have any remaining questions.
So what happens like when we are doing a task and uh, we cannot fulfill it to some other degree, like for example, like we got classes or we got uh, quizzes, exams, uh, anything related to our videos or uh, life and whatnot. So how do we, how do we handle that? Do we, as we are volunteering, do we like this uh, from the task or do we... Yeah. So how, how do we deal with uh, The question is about undertaking a task but being unable to fulfill it. You always have the temptation and the desire to volunteer. And that reflects a good intention. No question. However, one important thing, and that's the benefit of this question actually something I didn't mention you need to learn when to say no that's important there is always a limit because you were excited and you agreed to take that job and there was no way to finish it what happened instead of being in the level of Ihsan you are in the level of what shortcoming and you deserve blame instead of praise from the beginning you shouldn't have taken that now sometimes you couldn't have predicted that that's understandable there are priorities but you thought you could do it and then you couldn't if that's really the case what else could you do Allah Azza wa says La nafsan illa usaha. Allah does not burden a soul beyond its capacity Oh, people don't understand. It doesn't matter. Allah understands. If you explain to them, this is what happened. There was no possible way for me to do it. I really didn't know that this is going to happen. I cannot predict the future. So that's it. You are forgiven. Because Allah forgives you. So it doesn't matter what people... But if you, from the beginning, you knew that this would be tight, this would be difficult, and still you took it, no, it was your fault from the beginning. Always leave enough time. I learned that the hard way. I share with you an experience that I had. Just like now, I get a lot of invitations. And I ended up rejecting more than accepting. Because I simply don't have enough time to answer all, to entertain all the invitations. One time, a brother came to me, to the masjid, where I lead the prayer. And he told me that his daughter is having a wedding. It was the marriage of his daughter. It was Tuesday. So he told me he needed me on Thursday night. They are having the wedding right after Maghrib. Now, I looked at my schedule. I told him, Thursday night, I'm traveling to another town. I'm flying. Why? Because in Chicago, there where I'm flying, they need me before, one night before, because I'm giving the Jum'ah khutbah, and what happened in the past, they waited, and people canceled on them last minute, and they didn't have replacement. So you have to be there one night before. So I need to be there Thursday night, because I'm giving the khutbah, and I'm giving a program on Saturday and Sunday. So I told him, it will be really tight. Find someone else. He said, no, no, we want you, please, just a couple of minutes. It's just a wedding, nikah. We we have everything ready, we just want you to formalize it, ijab and qabul. I said, okay, but please be here, Maghrib time. So we pray Maghrib together and I go. I do it and then I leave on my way to the airport. He said, okay. Thursday came, Maghrib time came, I waited, I prayed the Maghrib, I waited, nobody showed up. I'm looking at my watch. I need to go and catch my flight. I waited almost until everyone, just like now, almost the masjid is what? Empty. So I had to go. Right before I arrived at the airport, I received a phone call. Uh, Sheikh, where are you? What do you mean? Where I am at the airport. How come we have a wedding? I told you, I need you at Maghrib time. I am on a tight schedule. He said, now you ruined our wedding. I said, you know what? You are right. It's my fault. Because from the beginning, I should have said no. That way, everyone is safe. 
find someone else. Your excitement to do good cannot be, should never be at the expense of something else. Have someone else. I just don't have time. Yes, I have desire to help, but there are limits for everything. So I learned this the hard way. So you need to learn when to say no. Saying no doesn't mean you're not good, you're not doing ihsan, or you're not willing to volunteer. No. Saying no, it's just meaning that you are prioritizing. You have something else to do. That's it. People can make demands of your time. They can. But only when you respond, it becomes obligation. So one easy way is to say no. I hope this answers the question. Yeah. So. I've been struggling with this all day long, so it's okay. Yes. Men and women. Yeah. The brother is asking about the restrictions of mixing with the opposite gender. You, you weren't present at the session? So? The, the restrictions are the same. You see, whether it is da'wah or even prayer, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, did men and women pray or no? They did. Did they even have a barrier like this? No. But still, they maintain the Islamic rulings. You maintain the Islamic rulings, whether it is work environment or da'wah environment or any environment. It's the same. Don't let the shaitan play this game that, oh, it is because of its da'wah for the sake of Allah, it's okay. No. <laughs> so, in principle, what I said, in principle, no mixing. You need that, you have to have a legitimate cause. Alone, you cannot be alone. What's the reason? Khulwa. These are the Islamic rulings. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal reminded us. Lowering your gaze. You see, Islam is realistic religion. Allah Azza wa Jal didn't tell us to blind our eyes. No. Allah told us to lower our gaze. So that means you look upon necessity when it is needed only. Nothing else. So within that frame. That's the umum. It's better. It is said that Imam Shafi'i said, seeking knowledge is better than uh, the nawafil. Could you explain what he meant? Yes. Seeking knowledge, Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah said that, but again, do not let the shaitan deceive you. Because that could be also a gateway of the shaitan. Oh, I'm seeking knowledge. What did Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah mean by that? When you seek knowledge, that knowledge would be beneficial to others. Your ibadah, nafil, is for you only. So which one is better? When you benefit others or when you benefit only yourself? When you benefit others. But that can never be at the expense of the essential ibadah. So once you do the essential ibadah, the obligations, then the nawafil, like the rawatib, then after that, yes. Not before that. So you cannot say uh, it's Sunnah Maghrib after Maghrib, which the Prophet ﷺ regularly, almost every single day prayed it. I will leave it because there is something else. No. No. After that, yes, seeking knowledge comes first. So essential ibadat, they come first. But Imam Shafi Rahman meant by that, that when you seek knowledge, you benefit others. It's always better than benefiting only yourself. That's what he meant. How to achieve sabr, even when difficulties continue to happen. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal reminded us at the end of Surah Ali Imran. 
يا ايها الذين امنوا اصبروا وصابروا صبر as scholars said from its name it's bitter it's not easy it is difficult and allah azza wa jal tests you more and more so the more you are tested you look at it as purification process that's what makes minerals and metals better gold the more heat the more other minerals are removed and gone and the pure gold is remaining so the same thing the prophet sallallahu said people are tested based on their iman so that's how you look at it allah azza loves you he chose you out of everyone else to be tested don't say oh why allah tested me out of everyone else what did i do wrong no actually you could be doing something right who are the people that were tested more the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one test the Prophet ﷺ faced that we may face could make us depressed. One test only out of the many tests. Being born orphan. Having to bury his own mother. Just imagine at six years old burying his own mother. How would that leave you? What kind of trauma would that leave on the young? But we look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Everything is fine. Why? Because he was with Allah Azza wa Jal. So yes, it's true that life is not easy. That life is full with challenges. But that's the nature of life. You want life free from that, you're in, at the wrong place. This is Jannah, not life. So anytime you face that, you look at it as a filtration process, purification process to make you stronger and better. Inshallah. Okay. Uh, how do you deal with employers or bosses that are Muslims but they are not observing the Islamic rulings pertaining to the mixing with the opposite genders? Again, first step is to advise. Because maybe they don't know. Many times we assume that people know, but maybe they don't know. If they know, we did remind them. Our duty is to remind. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرْ Okay, I reminded them. They still insisted. Then you are at crossroads. Is it better for your religion to stay there? Or you have a better alternative? Sometimes when someone is drowning, the only thing they have is you. So you have two options. Either you drown with them or you leave them and save yourself. That's not the first option, but that's the last option. So it depends. You take these steps first. It does happen. And I've seen that. Anything else? Okay, so we reach the conclusion. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One more question? One last question. Okay. Suddenly it's. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you get back on track when you feel you went off a straight path? How do you build up your iman again when you feel your iman is low? We always ask Allah to guide us. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. And it is not being guided, but continuing on that guidance. So if you fell off track, how could you go back? Again, as I said, build a strong shield. Increase your ibadah. Pray to Allah. Dua. Achieve miracles. Pray to Allah. Ask Allah to put you back, back on track. One of the best things that is very rare in our time having a righteous companion a righteous friend look how the prophet ﷺ benefited abu bakr and look how abu jahl ruined ubay ibn khalaf so having a good companion that could help a lot 
المؤمن قوي بأخيه. So the believer is strong with his brother. So these are few practical steps that could help, inshallah. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.